I'll admit, I've been avoiding a lot of OSR or old school Renaissance stuff for years, mostly because Ben Milton over at Questing Beast does such a damn good job of reviewing it. He really focuses on only OSR and is able to pretty much cover everything notable in that scene. But one thing I wanted to see from him that I haven't, and frankly, haven't seen anywhere on YouTube, is a top to bottom explanation of old school essentials. I mean, a full blown comprehensive breakdown of what it is, where it came from, and what makes it so special. So this is that video. Well, two videos, this is the first one. Old School Essentials is the name of a product line of books written by Gavin Norman and published through his company, Necrotic Gnome. It sets out to recapitulate several very old versions of Dungeons and Dragons in a way that is clear and precise. The specific versions that OSE clones are the basic D&D game, written by Tom Moldvay and published in 1981, and the expert set that expanded on Moldvay's basic revision, written by David Cook and Stephen Marsh, also published in 1981. Those original rule sets came in boxed sets and over time became known as BX, short for Basic Expert. But here's the thing, Old School Essentials expanded to include another D&D rule set published originally in the book titled Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which later came to be known as AD&D First Edition or 1E. All the Old School Essentials books inspired by only BX content is referred to as its classic fantasy. But here's where I'm going to clear something up for you that took me a while to figure out. And by the way, this is my biggest complaint about Old School Essentials. This product line is super confusing. But here's the deal. If you just want all the rules, the BX and the 1E rules and classes and everything, masterfully integrated together in as few books as possible, Necrotic Gnome has actually put them into exactly two books. And those books are titled Old School Essentials Advanced Fantasy Player's Tome and Old School Essentials Advanced Fantasy Referee's Tome. Write that down somewhere because if you go to buy the books now, you'll get confused if you don't have the exact wording. Again, this is the Achilles heel of OSE that its product line is kind of a labyrinthine mess because all this stuff comes in smaller little hardbound booklets that I guess a lot of people go crazy for. But these two books, the Advanced Player's Tome and the Advanced Referee's Tome, that's what I'm covering in this video and the next because I think they represent the totality of Gavin Norman's achievement. And it's a monumental achievement, what he's been able to do. One thing is, when you go back in time and look at a couple of sacred cows, in this case, BX and AD&D 1E, and you wash them off and trim off the little hairs and package them nicely without really changing anything about them, you end up shining a bright light on not just brilliant concepts and design choices that have stood the test of time, but also the warts and oddities and head scratchers. I read these two books with an almost adrenaline-fueled level of glee because of how clear a glimpse they afforded into the original Dungeons and Dragons, but I gotta tell you, I was chuckling about how weird and arbitrary some of these rules are. I'll cover as many of these instances as I can in, the, in these videos. And just for the record, I think there are a lot of weird little warts on these sacred cows, but I still love these cows. They're great cows. You've probably seen it a million times already at this point, but the quality of OSE hardbacks is pretty hard to gloss over. I think the most striking thing about these books is that they come in eight and a half by six and a quarter inch format and run about one inch thick each which makes them very handy, compact books. The covers are thick with a semi-gloss finish, and they come with really useful end papers filled with frequently referenced tables. Both books also come with a red and a blue bookmark. On the back are some selling points that don't quite manage to mention that these are a retro clone of two specific versions of Dungeons and Dragons, maybe for legal reasons, I don't know. There's not much to say about the inner paper quality. It's nice, no complaints. The colors are a bit muted, maybe because the paper is completely unglossed. Overall, the physical books are easy to read and hard to put down. Their size comports with the human hand, and since they are stitch bound, I suspect that with enough use, they will lay flat on any page. One of the things about this game is that it doesn't really come with its own setting, but it does. Over here on the right, the author lists a number of thematic principles in the game, and it's pretty much all the classic D&D tropes you'd expect adventuring in the wilderness and dungeons and caves, looting monsters, using magic and mingling with so-called demi-human species. Seems generic enough, but 
Through the course of this video, I'll point out some things that imply a much more specific world or setting, an implied setting as some might call it. One of the big selling points and the big reasons for the success of the OSE books is their complete compatibility with other BX supplements of the distant past and BX retro clones of the recent past, which is to say this is a BX clone with some elements of AD&D 1E added in, not the other way around. At the time of this recording, there are already hundreds and hundreds of supplements published under the open gaming license of OSE, which by their nature are all BX compatible. Your character is one of three alignments, law, neutrality, or chaos. I think the rules, especially the magic spells, really want you to play a lawful or neutral character rather than one of chaos. There are two ways to build your character, and they are either the basic or advanced way. These are derived from the two original versions of D&D that make up OSE. With the basic method, you choose a class and not a race. With the advanced method, you choose a class and a race, and can also start with up to three classes. Multi-classing has its own set of rules if you're at all familiar with D&D. The most notable, I think, being that when you earn XP, you have to split that XP across all your classes. So you basically level up a lot more slowly. The basic method of character creation here is largely similar to the advanced method in most respects. In a nutshell, you're rolling up six ability scores and those will inform what class and possibly what race you can be. Once you've chosen your class and race, your special abilities are all but chosen for you. Equipment and armor are likewise barely even a choice. You might be able to choose between a couple types of armor and weapon types, but you get 3d6 times 10 pieces of gold and maybe a secondary skill. When you throw choosing a race into play with the advanced method here, you do need to take into account extra race abilities and features, but not anything else as far as I could tell. Depending on your ability score, other modifiers are generated. These are each tied to a small number of very specific functions. For example, strength produces a melee attack modifier and determines your chance of forcibly opening a door. Dexterity determines your armor class, ranged attacks, and initiative modifiers. Okay, so I mentioned a minute ago that this game doesn't have a setting, but it does imply one. Here's the first solid example of that in the languages list. This list implies a lot about the world you're supposed to be playing in. None of it is particularly shocking or profound, but it does draw a clear outline of a setting. What at first blush might now be written off as classic fantasy is really just one very specific flavor of Western fantasy that everything but the kitchen sink smorgasbord of races all living together on a continental landmass and wandering about occasionally to get slaughtered by a group of adventurers. And it is what it is. And here are those adventurers now, ready to kick down some doors. There's a lot to say about the character classes in this game. First, as has been mentioned, anytime anyone has ever talked about OSE, each class and really every subject in the game is addressed across at max two pages. So everything you need to know specifically about the acrobat class, for example, is going to be found on these two pages which is great since it eliminates the mental uncertainty that comes with not seeing everything all at once. The books are extremely appealing user manuals in this sense, and their usability leads to being able to absorb and memorize the information faster. Another thing about classes in OSE, at least in the advanced fantasy version we're covering here, is that it has more classes than in the original games. The seven original classes in the Moldvay Cook version were fighter, thief, cleric, magic user, elf, halfling, and dwarf, but in OSE, there are 22 classes. You'll notice that some of these are merely the name of a demi-human race, but that's in the spirit of the original game. The race is the class. There are some exceptions to this that we'll get to in a minute. Anytime you pick a class, you pretty much go down a single page of information to make sure you meet the requirements, have the right type of armor and weapons, and write down the abilities. There aren't really a whole lot of new abilities that you get when you level up in this game. In fact, each class appears to just have one or two cool new abilities when you hit level eight or nine or sometimes 11 or 12. Some classes like the Barbarian have a dedicated probability chart for specific skills that increase as you level up. The Cleric has a table for tracking your ability to turn the undead. If you're wondering what hit dice of monster type means, that's the game's way of rating a monster's general difficulty. It also has the same function as your class's hit dice, which you roll at character creation 
and every time you level up to determine and add to your maximum hit points. Honestly, I think it would have been nice if this game had come with character sheets for each class that included all these abilities pre-printed on the sheet because you actually start with a ton of these skills or whatever in any given class, but you have to write all this stuff in yourself or have your book open to the page or memorize all this stuff. I guess I'm just used to playbooks that you see with Powered by the Apocalypse games, which contain everything you need to know about your character type right there on the page when you print it out. OSE offers nine races to choose from as opposed to the original three from BX. If you play rules as written, the demi-human races can only be played with certain classes. If you wanna lift the class restrictions, then the author asks you to employ certain enhancements for the human characters. Each of the races fit very neatly onto a single page and they are composed of their benefits and restrictions. This is another place in the books where you're going to see more of that implied setting in the descriptions of each of these races. The cliches are laid down really thick, but that's expected since the game is called old school essentials. I do find it hard sometimes to latch on to anything interesting or inspirational when it comes to these ultra cliche fantasy race descriptions. But again, it is what it is. You'll notice that some races have more classes available to them than others. At first blush, this sort of makes sense in following the classic understanding of these fantasy races, but strictly from a player freedom perspective, this can get a little old after a while. So again, you can play the optional rule of allowing any demi-human character to be any class they want. What that does is give them not only their class abilities, but racial abilities on top of that, the combination of which may not have been intended. To counterbalance that, humans would get several bonuses to their character because under normal circumstances, the only special racial ability that humans get is the ability to choose any class. So this is a way of balancing that out. The player's tome doesn't really explain how XP is awarded, except to say that it comes from two sources, treasure recovered and monsters defeated. I'll cover the specifics of XP rewarding in the referee's tome video that I'll do. Your character could get a bonus to any incoming XP they receive if their prime requisite or main ability score for their class is high enough, or actually get reduced XP if that stat is too low. As far as increasing your hit points when you level up, you roll the hit die specified by your class once and add that to your max. The book throws a bunch of potential titles that you can acquire based also on class. And I thought a lot of them were fun, but there are a lot of repeats and the ones for dwarves, gnomes, and halflings have the name of the race stuck in front of them, which is a bit underwhelming and unlikely, I think. Money can be broken down into five coins of different metals. The table on the bottom left here explains the exchange rate. As far as one character passing down their wealth to a new character starting at level one, that wealth is taxed by God knows who at a rate of 10%. And for whatever reason, a player can only pass down an inheritance like this once. This is a weird rule. I get why it exists, but it's just a bit awkward and blunt. And just for the record, this game is meant to be tinkered with and argued about. So it's not like this particular rule is written in stone or anything, but as written, it's just odd. Your adventuring gear options are very standard. You'll notice here with the sacks that they are rated by how many coins they can hold. It's explained later in the book that this is not necessarily a reference to literal coins, but coins as the standard unit of weight in the game. 10 coins make up one pound of weight. One other important detail in these descriptions is how long a torch will burn for, and that's one hour. All demi-human races have infrared or infravision, but if you're running an all-human party, it would help to bring lots and lots of torches. Your choice of weapons in this game covers a typical spread of medieval European technology. What I found most surprising was the almost painful simplicity of the armor. When it comes to armor, you get leather, chainmail, or plate mail. Depending on how nitty gritty you wanna get with encumbrance, you can either count your weapons and armor as part of your encumbrance load or hand wave it. All the weapons are listed a second time on the right, detailing their damage die and whether they are melee or missile, along with any other relevant tags. The numbers listed next to every ranged weapon indicate the weapon's range at close, normal, and far distance in feet. Close range always gives you a plus one bonus to hit, medium range, no bonus, and long range, a negative one penalty on your to hit roll. Rules on poison really illustrate the beauty of this game. The rules are not overly simple, nor are they overly elaborate. You can poison your weapon, but it wears off over time or after two attacks. There are four levels of lethality with poisons that are meant to enter the bloodstream directly, 
and five levels of lethality for poisons meant to be ingested. These levels each have different chances of detection, onset times, and consequences for succeeding or failing a safe throw versus poison. The whole set of mechanics is so tightly presented that there is more than half a page left over to include this hilarious illustration. All vehicles have hull points, and as those hull points are whittled down by damage, the vehicle's movement rate is reduced in equal measure. Once a vehicle is reduced to zero hull points, it will fall apart in 1d10 rounds. Repairing a vehicle in the field can only get it back up to half its max hull points. Beasts of burden are a bit of a different animal. They have armor class and hit points like any living creature, and the ones listed in this book have a few special features. I've become almost obsessed with dog stat blocks and RPGs at this point, and the dogs in OSE do not disappoint, especially the war dog, which is trained to wear armor, specifically leather armor with a spiked collar, which improves its AC by two. Carts and wagons may seem kind of boring at first, but if you've ever played a dungeon looter like this one, and your DM is a stickler about encumbrance, you'll suddenly get really interested in the stats of the mule-drawn wagon that the local mud farmers may be willing to sell you. It's tough to say if you'd ever end up using the stats for all these different boats, but it's nice to have all this laid out for you rather than not. Unlike most spreads in this book, the one on watercraft goes on for four pages instead of two. Anyway, it's there if you need it. Hired help is actually a big part of this game. The book mentions later on that an ideal adventuring party is six to eight adventurers for the sake of actual survival. It says that if you don't have enough players to fill out a party that size, you can hire retainers and mercenaries. And if you recall in ability scores, your charisma rating is pretty much devoted to your success in hiring NPCs. Your charisma modifiers are pretty much all devoted to your success in hiring and retaining NPCs. The first kind of hireling you can pick up is a retainer. They can't be higher level than your character, and they're not going to ever rush into battle and just die for you. Also, you need to promise some kind of pay as well as a share of whatever treasures you secure in your adventures. But even hiring them in the first place is a whole mini game where you roll 2d6 with all kinds of possible modifiers to see how they'll react. Anytime there's danger and at the end of every adventure, you're also rolling 2d6 again to check their loyalty to you. The higher your charisma, the higher the likelihood they won't abandon you. Another kind of hireling you can acquire is a mercenary, but these are more like off-screen contractors, not NPCs that adventure with your party. Which is to say, there's a whole other element to this game that starts to get alluded to right here, and it's this element of higher level domain management. The book doesn't go into any detail here, except to say that you can hire all kinds of different soldiers at standard monthly rates. Specialists are a third kind of hireling you can get, and they're more like mercenaries than retainers. They are paid per month and also do not go on adventures with you. When you look at this list, it gets a bit clearer, this mysterious new element of the game. It appears that players, if they have enough money, can hire up staff to run a fort or a stronghold. And here it is, strongholds. There are seven specific steps to building a stronghold and the costs are astronomical. The scale at which players are expected to spend makes it seem like this is an entirely separate game bolted onto this one. Notice that step seven even suggests clearing the lands around a stronghold in order to attract settlers and establish a so-called dominion. Domains such as these require regular patrols to protect your settlers, and your characters might end up enjoying the fruits of taxation foisted upon these people. But there isn't any more discussion on the matter. The book goes on to explain the costs of specific structures. These are essentially components of a medieval castle or fortress with very specific dimensions and costs. On the right here, there's an option to get specific about the interior furnishings of the castle, right down to the materials used for the floors, roofs, and trap doors. Which is to say, this interior design thing is really a third type of game, different from the dungeoneering and the domain management. Weird. There are two sources of magic in this setting, non-setting, and that's arcane and divine. A character's class determines which of four lists of spells they have access to, and the character's level determines how many spells they can have memorized, that is, poised and ready to cast at any given time. This whole memorization requirement is the crux of what makes magic rare and difficult in this game. A caster needs a full night of uninterrupted sleep and an hour of study to refresh their minds with spells to cast, and any time they cast, or even try to cast and are interrupted, that spell is erased from their mind and they need to sleep 
and study all over again to cast it. They also need to be able to speak and move their hands when casting any spell in this game. Arcane casters use their spell book to memorize spells from and are limited to whichever spells they have in their book. Divine casters memorize spells through prayers and can choose any spell in their class's spell list that are within their level requirements. The rules for spell books are fairly punishing and limiting. Standard rules dictate that a spell book can only contain the number of spells that a character is able to memorize at any given time. The advanced rule opens that up to virtually no limit. But either way, adding spells to the book ranges from a one-time chance using your int modifier to a week of studying with a mentor or somehow adding it through magical means. Creating new spells takes two weeks per spell and a thousand gold per spell level. This is another rule I find kind of strange where there is a specific meta limit on the player without any explanation. In this case, the book doesn't explain where those thousands of gold are supposed to be going. Maybe it's to the same purse that you pay your 10% inheritance tax to. The four spell lists are refreshingly simple and nostalgic, but there is clearly a bias against clerics and druids and towards illusionists and magic users. The cleric and druid lists are quite a bit shorter and thus have less variety. The lists for illusionists and magic users are pretty substantial, even at this primordial stage of the game's evolution. I'll say on a personal note, and it's really minor, but I really appreciate spell names that don't make reference to any NPC's names. I like this brand of sterility in my spell nomenclature. Also, it's worth mentioning that both the cleric and the magic user have access to the spell light. If you recall my comment about needing lots of torches in this game, you'll know that the light spell is surprisingly useful. I really like the presentation of the sixth level magic user spell reincarnation, in which a character can return to life, but possibly in a different body. This spell has a whole page full of tables devoted to it. It's a shame that it's so hard to attain level six spells in this game because this spell is a lot of fun. The game asks you to do a number of mildly unusual things here in this adventuring section. As mentioned before, your party should be six to eight adventurers. That's just a function of survivability, but it really is a lot of characters to be tracking, especially during a combat. It also says, quote, characters more than four levels apart should adventure separately. My knee-jerk reaction to statements like this is no, but again, the game is shifting the burden of its mechanical fragility onto its participants. And if you wanna play it properly, I guess, you need to keep your players within four levels of each other. The next oddity right here on the first page is that players should arrange the characters into a marching order and delegate a caller who describes the actions and movements of the entire party. And another player should be responsible for mapping the party's progress. I actually found that last bit to be pretty fun. There's a lot to be said for having the players mapping out their perceived portion of an area map and it not necessarily being accurate. It can definitely be stressful on players, but it can also create a lot of fun tension as they grope their way through the fog of war. Encumbrance rules come in two flavors, basic and detailed. Basic is only concerned with the weight of any treasure being carried. Detailed gets into tracking everyone's gear and armor as well. Again, weight in the game is measured in coins, if at all. Okay, so here are the hard rules of OSE, the actual dice roll mechanics. Anytime you're checking on an ability, you're rolling 1d20 and adding modifiers, either from your ability scores or from gear or circumstances in the environment. The difficulty or target number you're rolling against may also be modified depending on the situation. An unmodified one is always going to be a failure and an unmodded or natural 20 is always going to be a success. One of the major culprits of the abundant tables and numbers that you see in this game is saving throws. Anytime a character, whether they are a PC or NPC, is trying to resist against certain kind of attacks, the player or GM rolls 1d20 with the aim of getting at or over the saving throw score. Honestly, the whole saving throw ecosystem of numbers in this game is a little awkward if you take a step back and look at what you're tracking. The five categories are death rays and poison. That's one category. Wands, so any magic originating from a wand is its own category. Paralysis or petrification. Breath attacks, which in a vast majority of cases is dragons in this game, which is to say one specific kind of attack from dragons. And finally, spells, rods, or staves. Magical attacks specifically from non-wand sticks, as well as all other spells not covered in the previous categories. Make no mistake, these categories have been around since forever and they're classic and whatever, but they're weird. 
Regardless of if they're weird or however I personally feel about them, they take up a lot of the game's mental space in a way. For example, every class has its own saving throw level progression, where your saving throw scores improve slowly over time as you level up, but not at every level. But every NPC also has a saving throw array, as you can see with these animals of burden. It's just a lot of numbers to have in every stat block in order to track some oddly specific types of damage that are really lopsided in their organization. Anyway, when you roll a successful saving throw against something that causes damage, you don't actually avoid all the damage. You still take half the incoming damage. One other thing I found interesting was that if you fail a saving throw versus poison, you're almost always going to lose that character. They're dead most of the time. As far as healing goes, you can recover 1d3 hit points with each full day of rest. Zero HP means you're dead. And in the case where you die by an attack spell or something like a breath weapon, your equipment is all destroyed too. Except sometimes your magical items might survive. The GM might allow you to roll saving throws for each piece of magical gear in that case. Death is not absolute in this game though. You can be brought back from the dead with magic as many times as you have points in constitution, which can be a lot of bites at the apple if you think about it. Although each time you do come back, your con is reduced by one point. And this whole raise the dead thing is an optional rule. I mentioned it before, but all non-human monsters and demi-humans in this game have infravision, meaning they can see heat signatures in the darkness, generally up to 60 feet. Probably one of the most important little sections of this game is right here on the bottom right on wandering monsters. Basically, the GM is rolling for random monsters to appear and confront the party pretty frequently. And depending on what kind of terrain they're on, possibly very frequently, parties can decrease this chance of a random encounter by producing less noise and light if it's dark. But this right here really defines a lot of what you do in the game. You fight or run away from monsters a lot. There are three kinds of adventuring defined in the game. The first is dungeon adventuring, which has its sequence of four steps per turn. One, the GM rolls for wandering monsters. Two, have players decide on actions. Three, describe how those actions play out. And four, update the durations of any active light sources, spells, supplies, and the like. Then repeat. I thought there were a few oddities in this section, such as characters always have a one in six chance of finding a secret door if they're looking for one, regardless of their ability scores. There are exceptions to this, depending on which class you've chosen, but I did think it was odd that there's otherwise always just a one in six chance. Also, characters have a one in six chance of detecting subtle sounds through a door if they're trying to listen behind it, and a one in six chance of finding a room track. Just one in six across the board for a lot of this stuff. And every two turns in a dungeon, there's a, you guessed it, one in six chance of a monster encounter. The second kind of adventuring that the game offers is in the wilderness. The play cycle is largely the same, except it's assessed per day as opposed to per turn and the scale at which you move around is in yards instead of feet. Also, there's a chance of losing direction. There are a few paragraphs that describe what being lost entails. Basically, the GM keeps it a secret if the players get lost, and it's assumed that characters have no sense of cardinal direction whatsoever in this case. At this scale of movement and play, characters can also employ flying creatures that they can ride on. I didn't actually see any of these in the Beasts of Burden section, but apparently it's a viable option. If the party devotes a day to foraging or hunting, they have a one in six chance of finding stuff to eat. The losing direction mechanic is based on three different categories of terrain. I feel really bad for players when reading these probabilities of getting lost. It just seems inevitable that they're going to get lost. As far as rest, characters need to spend an entire day to rest for every six days of travel. It's not clear in the rules here if they can spend that day hunting or foraging, but my guess is probably not. As far as wandering monsters, the GM rolls for them anywhere from one to four times per day, which means a party can pretty quickly get whittled down to nothing if they don't learn to run away from some of these encounters. It's just potentially a lot of monsters. Finally, there is waterborne adventuring, which just means on a boat of some sort. It's very similar in structure to wilderness adventuring, except even with a navigator on board, you still have a two in six chance of getting lost each day. Without a navigator and anywhere beyond 24 miles of land on a clear day, and your party is 100% instantly lost. One thing I thought was interesting was how many levels of breezes there are in this game. 
each of which affect your boat's movement rate. Due to the fact that your characters are in a land basically choking with fantasy monsters, you're going to be exercising this encounter sequence a lot. First, the GM resolves any surprise element. If one side gets the jump on the other, the surprised party rolls a d6 to resist, and will only be surprised if they roll a one or two. The side that does successfully surprise gets a free round of action. The next step in resolving an encounter involves figuring out where everyone is in terms of ranges. If you're playing with a gridded map, this is almost automatic. Place your tokens, basically. The third step is each side rolls a d6 for initiative. The higher roll wins. If it's a tie, then both sides can roll again, or somehow it's decided, I'm guessing by the GM, that all actions that round happen simultaneously. I think this is pretty unusual since most games nowadays either opt for turn-based combat or simultaneous combat, but not both. They're really two very different ways of resolving action. Anyway, the fourth step in this encounter sequence is the players deciding how they will act. That's usually to fight, cast magic, flee, or parlay with the enemy. The GM also decides here how the monsters will act, and I really, really appreciate this monster reaction table because it acts as a huge relief valve to constantly having to battle monsters. If the GM faithfully uses this table, in about half the encounters, the monster will actually not want to fight. And a character with a high charisma who attempts to parlay with the monsters can actually drive up that chance of avoiding a fight. The other common way to avoid combat is to evade or flee, but that doesn't always result in safety. Anytime a party tries to flee, there's a chance the monsters will pursue. That's up to the GM and the monster reaction role, and the actual chase is broken down into everyone's movement rates. Players are given the option to drop food and treasure in order to slow down any pursuers, and there are specific rules on a chase depending on if it's happening on foot, on a boat, or in the wilderness. So that was all the general rules for an encounter, but if it's the case that combat will occur, there's a specific play cycle detailed for everyone to follow. At the start of combat, casters have to announce what they're going to cast. Then all sides roll a single d6 to determine initiative order. An alternative rule allows players to roll initiative individually, and that can add some much needed strategy to a combat. But making casters decide on their spell before this happens does remove them a bit from any kind of on-the-fly strategizing. The next step is the winner of the initiative roll, Axe. The first thing to resolve is an optional rule called morale. All monsters have a morale rating from 2 to 12. When making a morale check, the GM rolls 2d6, and if the roll is above the morale rating, the monster will flee or surrender. If the roll is at or below the monster's rating, they'll stay and fight. A morale rating of 2 means the monster will never fight, and a morale rating of 12 means it will always fight into the death. But the GM doesn't make a morale check every round of combat. It's only suggested to roll morale when there's a first death of an ally monster in combat, or when half of any party of monsters has been incapacitated. The next thing is movement, and then ranged or missile attacks. Again, missile attacks each have a close, medium, and long range to them, affording a plus one, zero, or negative one to hit, respectively. Then there is magic casting. In addition to a caster needing to be able to freely speak and move their hands when casting, they also aren't allowed to move in the same round. And if they are interrupted for any reason, Again, that spell is spent or erased from their mind until they've had a nice long sleep and an hour of study or prayer. Finally, there's melee attacks. Both missile and melee attacks are where the infamous Thacko appears. There's actually an easy and a hard way to resolve attacks with Thacko. The hard way goes like this. You roll 1d20. If it's a melee attack, you add your strength modifier. If it's a missile attack, you add your dexterity modifier. That resulting number is then cross-referenced on a table called an attack matrix against the attacker's Thacko, or to hit armor class zero. If this resulting number, called a hit AC, is equal to or lower than the opponent's AC, the attack hits and then you roll for damage. In the example of this provided in the book, a fifth level fighter attacks a monster with an AC four. So one, the player rolls 1d20 and it comes up a 14. Two, the fighter has a strength score of 13, so that gives them a plus one to melee attacks. Thus, the attack roll is 15 total. Three, this fighter has a Thacko score of 17 plus two. That's 17 if you're using the traditional descending armor class method, or two using the ascending armor class method. 
These Thaco scores are listed by class and get better by level. So anyway, you go to the so-called attack matrix for this game and find where a Thaco of 17 is located and put in your attack roll result, which was 15 in this case. That indicates the attack has a hit AC of two. Step five, since that hit AC of two is less than the monster's AC of four, the attack hits. I mean, that's cool if you wanna play out combat that way. The optional rule though, I find a bit more palatable. It involves rolling 1d20, adding your strength or dex modifier, then taking your character's Thacko score, which is again denoted by class and level, and subtract the enemy's AC from that score. Your attack roll needs to meet or exceed that Thacko minus the enemy AC number. This is basically using Thacko directly, as opposed to going through the attack matrix to resolve attacks. One thing I thought was interesting about combat was that in the basic rules, all weapons do 1d6 damage, modified by strength if it's a melee attack. The optional rule allows you to use a weapon's variable damage die and actually get slightly more realistic results. Okay, I'm a little tapped out on explaining the combat of this game, so here's some secondary rules on combat if you wanna read them. Ah, there is one cool thing here that I wanted to mention. Subduing enemies is a thing where you can announce that you want to render damage to a creature to the point of surrender rather than kill it. And the GM will then track subduel damage for that creature. Once you whittle down their subduel HP to zero, they are said to be at the point of surrender. This is actually a pretty huge element of the game if the GM is open to it. The rule pretty much says that you can beat down any creature into submission rather than kill them, which might mean that you can employ them to your cause. So that's the Old School Essentials Advanced Fantasy Player's Tome, a book that weaves together two old versions of Dungeons and Dragons for players. The other half of this game is in the Referee's Tome, which I'll cover in my next video. I'm reserving my final thoughts of this whole game for the end of the Referee's Tome video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the rules and concepts covered in this video down in the comments. Thanks for watching. Links are below. See ya.